is Greg Felix. I am the Vice President of Strategic Solutions for Excella. And with me today is Judy, Judy Steele. And I'm going to let Judy introduce herself and a little, little bit about her background, because this session really is all about sharing some of the insights and the learnings from a regulator. So if you wouldn't mind. Good morning. I'm Judy Steele. I'm a director in Acela's Center of Expertise, a cannabis regulation expert. Prior to working with Acela uh, last year, I was part of the project team that stood up the licensing systems for the state of California agencies that um, now handle the cannabis licensing out there. And before that, I worked for the city and county of Denver for five years. I was the deputy director and sometimes the interim director over excise and licenses. Um, you heard from Ashley Kilroy this morning. She was the last director I worked with, with uh, in Denver. And then prior to that, I was with the state of Colorado for 21 years, uh, mostly Department of Revenue and Secretary of State's office. Thanks, Judy. So, um, we're going to cover a couple of key topics, but we want to, we'd really want to get to those insights as quickly as possible. So what I'm going to do is skip some material. Much of it, of it was covered today earlier um, when we were talking about the evolving market. I think we can all agree that cannabis legalization in one form or another, it's coming at us and we need to deal with it and it needs to be regulated and there needs to be oversight uh, and that's what you guys do. But by way of just some level set understanding, uh, you all know that this is what the picture looks like today. All of Canada, legal, October 17th, there's what's coming up, coming uh, around in November 6th. The states that are going to be, or at least that's projected, that there's four states, two of which will be medical, two possibly as recreational, adding to the 30, now 31 states that have some form of legal cannabis. So it's, it's accelerating, we know that. And we also know as regulators that you know, these are all the things, the things you see on the left-hand side of the screen that you concern yourself with. Obviously, top of the list is community safety, public safety, um, and everything that that really means. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the, the integrity of the product, but I'm talking about access by youth and so forth. And there's a lot of other things that I know you guys are all concerned with and really focused on as you're looking at your regulatory frameworks and the things that you want to accomplish in your programs. A lot of things related to even education. Uh, yes, there are some elements around medical use of cannabis, but there's also some downsides to healthcare. Any anytime you ingest something uh, or inhale something into your lungs, there may be a, a, a downside to it. We have to keep our eyes towards those things. Earlier today, you heard uh, the folks from Canada talking about the use of digital data. So wouldn't it be great to have this kind of information to start doing some analytics and some predictive analytics to do things like predictive enforcement when in, for, when in fact that might be necessary. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that as we move on, but I think you guys all recognize that these are things that probably each and every day, if you already have a program, you're focused on and, and uh, really looking to accomplish. Um, I think you also know in the US who's responsible for regulating what in this dual system that we have in the US of course, nothing on the federal side uh, is, is being handled by the federal government. It's still being on Schedule One, and that has all kinds of downstream uh, implications, including banking, and it really does have uh, a, a lot of implications beyond banking as well. But when we're looking at uh, state and local governments, the areas of responsibility I think you're all quite aware of, so I don't need to review this list with you, but I think you're, you're aware of this. It works a little different in Canada. Um, where it's shifted more towards uh, the federal government and the provincial governments, as we heard earlier today. Yes, there are also local municipality uh, responsibilities, but a primary big portion of this is really handled, if you will, to the left. That would be to the federal responsibility and the provincial governments. Each has their role. The point that we make about this is that when you have this kind of a construct, there's a real important uh, aspect that we have to think about, and that is interdepartmental and interagency communication and collaboration. Though they each have their own separate set of goals in ways in which they operate, to really, to really operationalize a regulatory framework, you need to have streamlined processes, everyone working off the same bits of information as if it were one single entity for those uh, programs to be successful. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, today. Uh, especially as it relates to the role of automation in making that happen. What we've done at Excella is we've created this thing we call an end-to-end -end solution. 
So if you look at the extreme left-hand side of the screen here, that would represent those businesses that are perhaps uh, operating in the, we'll just call it the illegal market, that want to come into the legal framework. And there's a whole series of activities that needs to occur in order for them to move from that left-hand side over to the right-hand side, where they are now legal entities that you can count on that will uh, comply with your ordinances and regulations. And there's a series of, com of, of um, programs and capabilities that's necessary to bring them from the left into the right so that they can um, obviously uh, comply with your regulations. But we can't stop there. We have to look at things like engaging citizens. So it's not just the businesses submitting for permits, uh, or for licenses and applications, but it's also the ability to allow your citizens to engage with you to lodge a complaint. Gee, we saw some, or we smell some uh, um, odors coming from this grow, and you need to act on it. So the, the idea of engaging your communities is also part of this whole end-to-end -end solution. Of course, analytics and reporting is a very important piece of it, and it's not just for that local jurisdiction. And it's really you know, across all levels of government where you need to share this information, say, with the state or provincial to the federal and so forth. And then as you look in the, the, the right-hand side, um, those of you on the state side, uh, state-level government, need to be concerned with things like track and trace. How many are involved with the track and trace system today, right now? Yep. So uh, we work with all of the vendors out there. We have a partnership with Metric, where we, you know, of course we can um, share information with each other through an open API, but we're also looking for ways in which we can streamline additional workflow that goes beyond just data exchange, but looks for workflow improvements and also sharing information to inform analytics even more. So um, that's part and parcel to what we do. And the last piece, everyone have a medical program in place? Who has a medical program in place? Okay, you need to, you need to manage the patients, right? P patients and caregivers provided, uh, providing uh, to those, those patients. What we've created is a patient registry that allows you, within our solution, allows you to track those patients and care providers. So what we've tried to create is as few moving parts from a vendor perspective for an entire end-to-end -end solution to support your regulatory framework. Um, I'm not going to get into a full-blown demo. Time doesn't allow for that. But uh, you can read here, and I'm not going to read all the bullet points, but what you really need when you're doing an end-to-end -end solution is you need comprehensive functionality that out of the box will address 80, 85 percent of your needs for cannabis regulation. And then the rest of it is really personalization that you want to apply uh, as it relates to your jurisdiction. So I won't go through all of this, but there's some very important pieces here. Workflow is king here. To be able to effectively and efficiently uh, ensure that your regulatory framework is being consistently carried out, you need the tools, and by this I mean expert rules that will drive workflow so that everyone's on the same page. And that's exactly what we have built, and that's expressed in, f in the form of dashboards that based on my user login, the dashboard will come up for the things I need to do and, and direct me as to the actions and tasks, tasks I need to complete. Um, big piece of this is also the interdepartmental communication and collaboration that needs to occur. So no one is becoming mutually mystified as to what's going on with regulation, uh, not even the citizen. You will now be able to tie the citizen to the process and automatically inform the citizen without a lot of intervention on your part in the back office to, so they know exactly where they're at with respect to the application or if it's an enforcement activity and things of that nature. Um, I talked a little bit about open APIs. Think about it from the perspective of, say, uh, being able to go out and immediately uh, go out to the DOJ system for this business that may be applying to see whether or not there's criminal activity associated with that business or the person that was the owner of that business. And then finally, we talked about the importance of reporting and analytics and auto-publishing data. You know, as was said earlier today, uh, this is a controversial topic, cannabis. And the public wants to know, and there's a lot of transparency that's expected of all of us. So you're probably going to want to be able to provide the right information as you deem appropriate to your citizens so they know what's going on in the program as well as to other um, uh, those who need to know. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time around this simply because I want to get to Judy's uh, insights, but it's really important to know that at the back office, workflow and optimizing the workflow will be the thing that you really need to focus on primarily because of the volume and the scale that's coming at you when in fact you do go, say for example, recreational. 
you'll be surprised on the volume that's going to hit you. It's going to be like a fire hydrant that you're trying to drink from. So the more you can do to optimize your workflow, uh, the better off you're going to be to handle that, uh, handle that volume and at the same time ensure that your regulatory frameworks are being complied with. Um, and the other thing it, uh, it also does is allows those citizens and also those businesses that are applying or that are, are part of uh, this regulatory framework to know what's going on. We've talked a lot about, you've heard it earlier this morning, we will continue to talk about this. Utilization of digital data is the thing that's going to really help us as, as we're looking at the um, regulatory framework and its effectiveness in the market. Uh, I am keeping a very close eye on the time here, so I'm going to keep this short here and get right to Judy's piece. But I think this last one needs to be said, and that is enforcement. It's one thing to have all of the regulations operationalized. And then, of course, you need to have the ability to efficiently and effectively, and we're going to share some information with you about the ROI associated with when, in fact, you do have an effective mobile solution that will allow you to carry out those enforcement uh, or the initial inspections as necessary. So um, last couple of points I want to make here. Uh, why should you reinvent the wheel? So we here at Excel have now got a lot of experience with what's required in standing up a system that will support your regulatory framework. And to that end, we now have what we call a standardized solution. All of the record types, all of the automation, that would be the, the workflow that's driven uh, and, and so forth, all of the integrations with other systems that are necessary, the reports. These things are prepackaged, out of the box, provided to you, and now all you're really doing is personalizing what's there in order that you can very quickly stand up the solution. I suspect, like many other jurisdictions, when you're granted by the voters the gift of cannabis legalization, you're not given a lot of time to stand up your regulations and a system to support that. When you have a standardized solution, it gets you there much quicker, and we're, we'll share some of that with you a little bit later. And then, of course, we can deploy this in the cloud. In fact, that's how we deploy it. And that gets us the ability to bring the system up quicker. The total cost of ownership is a lot lower. Our ability to support you with the standard solution is much better. And it's, we're far more agile. As we all know, regulation is going to change. What you set down today, I guarantee, is going to get refined as time goes on. So you need the ability to have a system that stands up very quickly, but also is agile as time goes on. So with that, let's move on to the value when, in fact, this kind of technology and this approach is applied uh, to jurisdictions. And with that, I'm going to bring up Judy to share some of her insights. Judy? Thank you. And thank you all for being here today and, and sharing your time with us. Um, data access, you know, as I mentioned, I was a regulator for the city and county of Denver. Data access uh, became a huge topic for us. In um, Denver, when we first started this effort, we really got a lot of attention around retail licensing and all the various license types that we had. And as we worked through those processes and we added the records to our Excel system, uh, with our, uh, there was a total of 108 different record types in the database at that time for various types of licenses. Cannabis was, you know, 3% of our total volume and probably took about 75% of our time and everything that we did. Um, and we um, learned as we started to kind of get out of our silo and partner with some of the other agencies within the city and county, such as fire, environmental health, building and permitting, we learned that it was really important for us to share information with other agencies. So we were able to do some permission controlled access to the database to give law enforcement the information that they needed to support them in their roles, um, city attorneys access to the database so they could review the files and prepare recommended decisions, hearing officers that we had working with our data. And that really helped reduce our staff time of dealing with those information requests. Um, there was very general information on the public portal for the media that they could pull, but there were a lot of requests coming to us all the time. Not to mention, Colorado has a dual licensing scheme set up so licenses are conditional um, 
on, on each other. You're required to have a state license and a local license in order to operate one of these types of businesses within the um, city boundaries. So that, w that was important to us. Application documentation. When we first started out, we created an application based on what we thought we needed to collect from applicants as they were applying for licenses. And then we designed the database to just capture those data elements that we thought were important to us for reporting. One thing that we did during the configuration of our records is we decided to capture the type of ex extraction processes that were being used in Denver. And actually, that became very valuable. We could start to look at business license information for infused product manufacturers, determine what type of extraction processes they were using. You can also do a cold water extraction and a cultivation here. So that gave us some additional information. And then, of course, back to data access, you're always asked by those decision makers that you work with, um, how many licenses do you have issued? How many applications do you have pending? Where are they located within our boundaries? Do we have high saturation somewhere and lower saturation in other communities? And looking at trying to find that fine balance. With the Excel system, we moved from a paper-based filing system to a digitized filing system. And I'll show you some um, ROI as the, or, um, uh, analysis that was done as a result after we went live on the system. That was extremely helpful for us, too. Um, but again, those documents could be uploaded and attached to the record. So we didn't have paper file files that we were transferring all around the office between staff processing those. Um, and that made it really easy. We were all working off of the same information every time we touched a license file. And we could tell when the applicant had updated it or changed it. The application status information became very important for us too. We were able to use that, add auto email notifications to our system. For example, to let a customer know, your expiration date is coming up. You're 60 days but prior to expiration, so your renewal window is open. You can go and file your renewal now. We would inform the customer again after expiration that they could file with a late fee. And then after that grace period window closed, we could then let the applicant know that their license was expired. They were no longer able to operate. Actually, they couldn't operate after they expired. They had to shut down, lock everything up, um, and renew before they could operate in good standing. And we shared that information with the state, too. We were able to generate reports to let the state know what the status of our applications were. When Denver first went live with retail, they went through an audit, an internal audit in the city. The state of Colorado also went through an audit um, close to the same time. And recommendations came out of both of those audits, talking about our ability to partnership with each other and share information. Um, so a lot of this really came out of that experience. In addition, the interagency coordination. As I had mentioned, we were a tad bit siloed in what we had done. We had always done it that way. It always worked really well for us. But with um, marijuana legalization, we learned that we needed to start partnering together. And we heard Ashley Kilroy touch on that in um, her message this morning, pulling those departments in, pulling our inspection uh, staff together from the various departments, working on the things that we were inspecting for, uh, determining what is, you know, uh, what qualifies as a, a past inspection or a failed inspection, and how we worked with the industry to bring them into compliance, helping them understand what the rules and regulations were. Also, that interagency collaboration, not only with the, with the, um, with the industry and the folks in the industry, so, so they weren't so challenged in getting to either getting their permits issued or their licenses issued, but again, also those um, agencies within the city and county of Denver, and then the state departments, um, Department of Agriculture, all those other various departments that we were tasked with, with working with. 
And then enforcement became an issue for us. Um, in the beginning, when legalization first happened, we were doing a lot of tracking of the applications. Where were customers getting stuck? In what part of the process? And how could we push out information to prepare them and help them get through that process? But then enforcement, too, as the inspectors from excise and licenses began to go out into the field and perform their inspections, we found all kinds of things. Sometimes cultivations were locked up. We couldn't gain access to those until we contacted somebody with that business and could get them to be there to unlock the building so that we could gain access. We found canine and armed security guards on site at locations. Um, we dealt with in, uh, inspectors who were having challenges with how they smelled after doing a cultivation inspection. They used their own vehicles in the field. So they would jump into their vehicle. All of a sudden, it reeked of marijuana, and they were headed to a daycare center to pick up their child. And then they wondered, what is this going to be like if I get pulled over while I have my child in the car with me? So we began looking at personal protective equipment, and we made that available to the inspectors. There was a different um, type of package that was put together for our inspectors versus our law enforcement officers. They were um, partnering with the inspectors. We were partnering with state investigators. And we were doing coordinated inspections. Um, and then that led to stings for underage sales and those types of things. Enforcement became a large part of what we were doing, too. And it needed to be tracked separately. We were asked for different uh, data and analytics around enforcement versus licensing. So that was really important, to be able to have real-time data in the hands of those inspectors and law enforcement agents, which they were able to do with our Excella system based on um, those permission, uh, specific permissions to the database to get the information that they needed. And then reporting to people such as city council. City council would call, a meeting would be coming up, or they'd have a special group that was looking at certain data. They wanted to be able to get reports from us. They wanted to be able to have maps to see what our concentration was looking like. And um, Denver even got to the point where they finally put a cap in on the number of licenses that could be issued within the city and county when uh, marijuana licensing first opened um, and became legal the the gates to the city were kind of opened up and we had all kinds of people applying or trying to do business in the beginning they just kind of hung up their shingle and uh, started operating so the landscape really changed for us over time and being able to get the data analytics out of the database quickly and efficiently and accurately supported that decision making in refining the rules and regulations and ordinances that they actually have now on the books. So I mentioned we went from a paper-based system to an uh, automated digitized system. And this is just some of the benefits that we saw in between those two different systems and how it kind of supported us. Some of our client agencies that Excella has worked with, the, this session is a little bit about customer case stories as well. We have several agencies that we've worked with. Denver really was the first one for a city and county, but since then, the state of Michigan, um, as I mentioned, state of California, both Bureau of Cannabis Control, and California Department of Food and Agriculture um, have also gone through this painstaking process. And um, we have some county agencies as well. So cost avoidance, digitizing the paper records. After our system, our scanners were put in place in Denver. And we did what I like to refer to as our blowback project where we took those great big filing systems that roll up and down the floor, you know, with a great big wheel on it, and had somebody come in and digitize all those records, do an audit for us, and add them 
to the um, automated records, the database that we had. Uh, we went from paper filing, which took us eight hours a day, to scanning documents down to one and a half hours per day. At first, our staff became very nervous. They were worried their jobs were changing. The skill set between these two things are a little bit different. Um, so we went through some training in the office and people actually saw that their jobs began to change. We had a large volume of license applications that needed to be reviewed, worked through, set up for inspections, all of that type of stuff. Filing really became an uh, afterthought kind of after for us. But when you were looking for a file, you had to run around to 10 different desks to figure out if it was even in your department. So um, again, Denver has realized $50,700 a year in cost savings. That's a three-year cost avoidance of $152,100 just from that small piece of digitizing the records. Then Gartner came in and they did some studies and for excise and licenses, one of the studies that they did were around our inspections. So um, just the licensing staff, and that doesn't include the other four head families as we used to refer to them, fire, building, all of them, um, just, just for our uh, inspectors. They would come into the office in the morning, they would prep all their inspections, they'd figure out where they were gonna go, they'd get out into the field, they didn't have the full day in the field. Then they had to gather all that documentation. They had to bring it back to the office. They had to get it scanned into the records. So when we launched the inspection app, they're actually able to use a device in the field. They can take a picture. They can add it to a license record, the inspection portion of that license record. The inspection stuff and the licensing stuff stay separate within that system. And they're able to result that inspection and an auto email notification is kicked off to the customer right at that point to let them know whether they passed or they failed and what they would need to do in order to come into compliance and reschedule their inspection. So long story short, um, they have realized an annual cost avoidance of 80500 three-year cost avoidance of $241,500. Um, and excise and licenses did not pay that much for their solution either. Um, so again, ad addressing, uh, this is regarding the state of Michigan with their solution that they deployed for licensing. They had 15 months to set up their agency, hire all of their staff, install the, the system to oper operationalize the framework, um, and they did that. They were successful. They have come a long way, and they are doing great things in the state of Michigan. Um, they've leveraged online access that, that enhances the applicant's convenience and reduces bureau staff workload. It actually prompts the applicant for each piece that they need to add as they're building their application and submitting that information to the agency. And Judy, I might add that I believe Michigan is one of those states that's moving from medical, from medical to uh, recreational. They are now positioned to take on that scale with what they define in the foundation that they laid down. Absolutely, and much like Denver, um, we had medical in place. We had launched our licensing system, and then recreational came to us, and we were um, configuring those records and trying to get those license records added to the system. Um, so being able to be agile and simply add a new record type to your database as, as a, a customer or a regulator, I just felt that that was huge. It's difficult to take stuff on paper and then try to munge it in to a system when uh, you don't have that to start with. Um, these are some outcomes for a local agency where they started with 160 applications in 2016 and a staff of only three people. And now they're processing or have processed 2,300 applications and the workflow steps that touch 60 different county personnel. This is from the county of Humboldt. Um, their, their goals were to provide a better way to interface with the public, 
They can obtain real-time information the public can from their citizen portal. They can actually extract licensing reports and pull down information that they need. And again, that's permission-based. So you can control what the public can access in those records. You decide as you go through the system what's visible and what's not visible. And it can be different um, depending on the type of license that you're dealing with, too. And then uh, Culver City just recently launched the Cannabis Civic application. Culver City was already a customer. They also handle building and permitting in their um, solution, and they added on cannabis licensing. Their uh, first implementation around permitting was uh, rather lengthy, and they were super excited. They were able to launch their cannabis system in about five to six months from the time they inked the contract until they went live. So getting through their, their user acceptance testing, um, their gap analysis, all of that. So that's really exciting too. And then um, the outcomes and values of having a digitized system. Uh, you know, it can it enhance public safety protection, again, just with your data analytics and the information that you're collecting helps you to make data-driven decisions and have accurate information when you need it in real time. Maximizing the agency resources. Oftentimes, my experience has been in cannabis licensing, there are a lot of touch points throughout the business process steps. So being able to serve that workflow up in an automated way that automatically passes it off to an individual or a group that needs to work a, sec a particular section really helps you not only track that and kind of audit-proof audit that process, but it also gives people what they need to work on in real time. And that's it for our presentation yep. today. So leave, we're gonna- Leave about 10 minutes for uh, questions. So um, if you have questions, please. Over yes, here. there's a microphone right here that you can use. And if you could just tell us your name and who you're with, that would be wonderful. Right yes. Uh, Alex Rubin with uh, Craft Concentrates. Um, so with the, the digitizing and, and the paperless um, things that you guys have been doing with your own company, I know that you work with Metric as well, that, stills require, that still requires certain papers and documentation within the state requirements um, on a tracking end. Is there anything that you guys are recommending to the straight, the state tracking um, software so that they would then implement digital um, uh, tracking as well. Um, you know, the, the paper that the industry has to go through, you've done all the, the calculations with that, you know the money that it, it could be saving. Um, every single business in the industry that uses metric still has to use paper in some way, shape, or form in terms of tracking, transferring products. Um, are you guys doing any kind of recommendations in terms of that as well? That's a great question. So um, you're right. With the metric system in the very beginning, uh, industry members, business operators, would have to track stuff in an internal software system or a spreadsheet, especially uh, batch testing results, um, their weights and measures, right? All of those types of things. And the system did not allow an interface for that information to, to just be uploaded. It had to be re-entered. And again, that's one of the challenges, right? It leaves room for human error. And um, sometimes there can be uh, typos that end up in the data that might get something off. We don't specifically work on those types of other things. We, we will discuss them with partners. For us, um, for Excella, there, there are a couple of ways that I've seen agencies handle it. 
It can be a simple system, right, that you're collecting all of the data elements in a user interface screen, and then that converts it into a PDF application and attaches it to the record sometimes. Sometimes people choose not to do that. My personal opinion is it's always easier to have something attached to the record because as a regulator, you can print it, certify it, and send it wherever it needs to go. Um, with cannabis licensing, taking Denver, since I know that very well, um, the state application requires a lot of supporting documentation with it. So does the local. For Denver, it, it's interesting. For medical, you start with the local when you apply. For the state, you start with the state, and then the state sends a copy of the application and half the application fee to the local. So in Denver, that starts the record there. Then the customer is contacted, then there's another application to fill out for Denver to collect that unique information that's unique to Denver. Um, that is done on paper or PDFs, and then it's uploaded and attached to the record. So the database doesn't collect every single element within that application. So I don't know if that helps answer your question some, but it's definitely something we could explore, and I know it's something you're interested in. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious how Excel is able to protect the data within the database. What kind of security measures does Excel take to keep that information safe? That's a great question. I'm going to let Greg take that one. Yeah, so of course we do what you would expect, you know, all the um, uh, encryption that's necessary for data at rest, for example. But one of the things that we're able to leverage off of, because we are running this in the Azure cloud, is to leverage the security that comes from that. When we're talking about data integrity, we're talking about the, you know, we all know that there have been breaches of, of data from systems out there in the market. And that's one of the reasons we go to a technology like Azure Cloud, because it brings to us a tremendous amount of security that we can wrap around that. And then, of course, we have the, the encryption that's necessary to ensure that that isn't intercepted and somehow utilized in ways that it shouldn't be. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? Hi, my, <clears throat> my name is Dusty Allen. I'm with the City of Aurora Marijuana Enforcement Division. And the question I have is, what connection does a seller have with metric? Hmm. Um, you know, that's, is the state operating on, on a seller? And I guess how do you guys have access to it and the municipalities don't? Sure. So the way in which we are pursuing a partnership with metric, typically this goes with the state, right? The states generally are the ones that are installing a track and trace system that we have seen counties do this as well. But the reason that we are uh, at least uh, initially um, partnering with Metric is so that we can take advantage of things that go beyond just standard API data interchange. So licensing information, information about that business going over to the Metric system, that's pretty straightforward. We can do that with any of them. Take your pick, MJ Freeway, um, BioTrack, and so forth. The reason we've partnered with uh, Metric is we think there are opportunities for us to go beyond just simple data exchange, whereby we can look at overall the end-to-end -end workflow and look for areas that the two systems can inform one another about what's going on in greater measure. So this would be more program-to-program -program connectivity as opposed to just a API sharing data. So that's really the nature of the, the, the uh, proposed relationship we got with Metric. That's not to say if you've already got an investment in BioTrack or MJ Free or the other, any of them out there that we couldn't also through an API exchange information. Does that answer your question? Is that what you're asking? Not Dusty, really. I'm going to add on yeah. to that. So it's not that we have access to the data within Metric, right? Because that would be contained by each customer or each state agency that's using it. It's our ability for the systems to communicate with each other. So whether it be passing a business name or a trade name, a DBA, right, or a license number, those types of data elements to verify 
that if, if this information is going into metric, is that a valid license? Can they enter that in, right? And if you, as an inspector, need access to any metric data, I would encourage you to reach out to the Marijuana Enforcement Division, Will Lucella, maybe, right, or Rick, and talk to them about whatever it, ne whatever it is that, that Aurora needs to um, work with the state concerning that, that information. Does that get more to your question or your, yeah? Okay, perfect. Other questions? Okay, nothing else? Well, we thank you for your time. We hope you found this informative. And uh, if you would like to get a hold of Judy or myself, our contact information is here. We're out at the booth. Happy to speak with you. We'd love to tell you more about what we do. Thanks for your time.